this webinar and introduce the speakers to you. This is one webinar out of a large series at the KNMA, uh, which have been uh, held since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and this uh, last, this next one in the series will really be uh, about what the near future holds uh, for COVID. Uh, just a few remarks uh, on the technical aspects. Um, you are joining, uh, if you are joining this uh, webinar uh, by Zoom, you will find at the bottom of your screen a Q&A uh, button, which can be used to ask questions to the speakers. Um, please be short in asking your questions so we can address as many as possible. And if your question is addressed at a specific speaker, please indicate so in your uh, question. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, I have to disappoint you that you are watching a direct live stream of this Zoom seminar, uh, but we will not be monitoring the chat on YouTube. So we will only be answering the questions from the Q&A in Zoom. And so without further ado, I think we should get started. We will have three excellent speakers tonight, followed by uh, a discussion of about 20 minutes towards the end where uh, we can have additional questions and discussions. And the first uh, speaker of tonight is André Knot Neves. André is a professor of primary healthcare at Maastricht University Medical Center. And André participated in a scenario study about the COVID pandemic on behalf of the Netherlands Scientific Council for the Government Policy, the ARF, and the Royal Dutch Academy of Sciences, KNRA that was entitled Navigating and Anticipating in Uncertain Times. And André will be presenting tonight on that topic under the presentation uh, COVID-19 scenarios for a long-term strategy under fundamental uncertainty. André, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. Uh, uh, it's great to share with you all the essentials of our scenario study. Uh, it is conducted and published by our Academy uh, and the WRR, the Scientific Council for Government Policy. And here you see our team uh, that is responsible for this work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and what I would like to share with you follows uh, these points, uh, something about background and approach. Uh, uncertainty in relation to models and scenarios, uh, the WRR, uh, and a W scenarios for the COVID pandemic will then be presented. Uh, I will give some general recommendations based on these scenarios. Uh, and I would also, if I have time, say something about the very recently published scenario study of the International Science Council. Next slide, please. Uh, as the Academy and the Council are both comprehensively addressing the full range of scientific disciplines and their interactions with all policy domains, um, our, both organizations thought in spring 2021 that we were, of course, um, very, very much concerned about the long uh, standing broad social impact of the pandemic in terms of public health, healthcare, economy, and society. Next slide, please. And just a brief summary uh, of this broad impact is in this slide, uh, of which I could also just, just mention uh, a few items very quickly. Um, for example, the domain of health, we all know that uh, we had a lot of direct and indirect impact of the um, pandemic, uh, including also deferred care, long COVID, still struggling a lot with it, uh, mental health, health inequities, uh, but also opportunities for learning, of course, uh, as we have seen a strong scientific development, for example. Um, we were also challenged as to social cohesion. Uh, we saw decreased public trust um, uh, internationally, 
uh, and a lot of social inequality problems being uh, enlarged. And as to economy, uh, there were generally a deep economic dip in some countries more than in others. There were support measures uh, and there was some recovery already um, in, and in some uh, fields uh, recovery very strongly. Um, some domains haven't even suffered like supermarkets and digital companies. Uh, but for example, culture, cafes and restaurants had much more difficulty. As to sustainability, we saw direct effects varying, uh, like less air, uh, problems of air quality, but an increase of waste. Um, and um, for example, in digitalization, we saw a huge acceleration, um, but also the problem of unequal access in terms of uh, age differences and, and low literacy. Um, and as to governance and law, um, we saw conflicting uh, fundamental rights, uh, and there was a lot of uh, difficult trade-off to make between fu fundamental rights, as we has, have uh, observed. Of course, governments did their best, but there were challenges that brought a lot of difficulty. Uh, and many of these challenges, uh, of I just mentioned some examples of, um, are uh, related to long-term issues, uh, which of course not only can be solved from the virological and medical uh, perspective, it needs also a broad scientific uh, and policy approach. Um, and um, of course, next slide please. Um, as to the, uh, this, um, uh, this approach we had, uh, I would uh, say that we thought that uh, we should present a long uh, uh, term focused strategic guidance uh, focused on the further cause of the pandemic and longer term policies. Our approach was um, extensive study of scientific literature, uh, monitoring epidemiology, using a broad input of experts in the medical health and also social sciences and our advice was published in September 2021. It's available on the link here. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, we have to say that the further course of the pandemic is still uncertain. Yes, we know the driving forces, but um, we also know the uncertainties related to them. Um, so we have a lot of more knowledge than we had before uh, regarding immunity, regarding vaccines, but we also know that uh, while vaccines are very strong in preventing severe disease, they are less strong in preventing transfer of the virus uh, and they may get less effective over time. I'm sure the other speakers will address this issue. Uh, and we've also seen some waves of mutations that surprised us um, uh, quite some um, times. Um, human behavior, uh, we have seen that this is very, very important for how the pandemic develops in terms of compliance to measures, which is not easy for many people for a long time, of course, um, to, um, to sustain uh, and in terms, for example, in terms of willingness to be vaccinated. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this related uncertainty is also demonstrated by what we have seen uh, from recent dashboard data from the Netherlands. Uh, and in the, the past weeks, uh, there has been observed an increase in the sewage water measurements of the number of virus particles per 100,000 uh, inhabitants in the Netherlands. We also saw an uh, uh, increase in the past weeks, step by step, of the number of hospital admissions, uh, still below 40 
um, um, admissions a day, but it is increasing steadily. Um, and what we have not yet seen is an increase of the intensive care unit admission. Uh, but we have, of course, enough reason, given the uncertainties mentioned, to be alert on what may happen. Um, and I'm sure that uh, the other speakers will say more also what is internationally reported. Next slide, please. So um, we think that our study is relevant uh, still after half a year after publication, I must say nine, nine months by now, um, in anticipating the various scenarios that we should consider given uh, uncertainty about a longer term course of the pandemic, um, where we have to say that predictive models giving lack of data uh, and increase of confidence intervals over time do not work so much for the longer term. Um, and that's the reason why we uh, have uh, uh, thought that it was good to have scenarios of what might happen. And these are no predictions, um, but conceivable possibilities for the course of the pandemic. Um, as a basis for scientific strategic guidance to policy with the main goal not to be surprised again. You can compare it with playing chess. The chess player cannot predict what the opponent will do, but uh, by thinking through the various scenarios of what the opponent could do and to do this with more steps ahead than the opponent, um, you will have a better outcome, a better chance to be successful. Next slide, please. And so uh, we came to our scenarios um, based also on uh, input of experts and international reviews. Uh, and um, these are the five scenarios, return to normal, flu plus external threat, continuous struggle, and worst case. And I will now briefly go through these scenarios. Next slide, please. So this is return to normal. Um, and it includes that COVID-19 is elimina eliminated throughout the world. Uh, enough people have become immune because of vaccination or recovery from infection. The virus is not mutating in a way that it escapes immunity and policy can fully focus on recovery and eliminating backlogs in, for example, healthcare and education. And by now, uh, after nine months, uh, I would say that um, this is not a, a very realistic scenario anymore because we know that SARS coronavirus 2 is expected to stay with us. Next slide, please. Uh, much more realistic is scenario two, uh, flu plus, as we called it, uh, in which COVID 19 is becoming endemic with periodical uh, waves uh, and um, um, potentially related to the need of. Uh, periodic measures and refactionation, especially for risk groups, uh, which may be necessary. Uh, recovery will then keep challenging uh, and uh, rather difficult uh, when um, there's pressure on healthcare periodically uh, to eliminate backlogs in care. And there may be a need accordingly for periodic upscaling of healthcare in a broad sense, not only the intensive care uh, units, but also public health services, primary care, uh, and home care, nursing care. Next slide, please. External threat. Um, this is also a realistic scenario. Um, and in fact, in the current situation, uh, we have some elements of it. A scenario. 
the virus is under control nationally, but elsewhere it continues to circulate and mutate into dangerous, potentially dangerous variants that may escape immunity. And strict border policies are uh, enacted, uh, as we have seen it before, in an effort to prevent new outbreaks in uh, so-called safe countries. And this may then lead again to international trade and travel disruptions. Next slide, please. Scenario four is continuous struggle, and we can't exclude this either way. Uh, and also of this scenario, we see some elements in the current uh, situation. Um, and in the scenario, COVID-19 remains a serious threat globally. The vaccines uh, are not working sufficiently or sufficiently long. New variants continue to develop, some of them being resistant to existing vaccines and difficult policy trade-offs between COVID care, regular care, and broader, longer-term societal economic goals with implications for social cohesion and trust. Next slide, please. In my view, um, given what we have in place now in terms of knowledge and tools, um, these scenarios may not be that likely, uh, this worst case scenario, but we should not uh, neglect this, um, at least as a basic warning, uh, warning to stay away from it as much as possible. Uh, in this scenario, COVID-19 continues to circulate worldwide with mutations um, claiming numerous victims every year, permanent code black on intensive care departments, uh, acquired immunity and vaccine effectiveness are limited. Um, and until the pandemic dies out uh, at a certain moment, which may last very long, society and the economy experience a long period of disruption. Policy focuses on core tasks, um, preventing uh, the most serious harm and social cohesion and trust uh, get further under pressure. Next slide, please. So, given these scenarios, some of them may be more likely than others, but we cannot ex exclude, uh, especially uh, two to five totally, um, should uh, make us alert to uh, be prepared. Uh, and um, of course, the next slide, please. The obvious aim of our efforts um, which should be efforts not only from policy, but also from society, from science, uh, from um, uh, all citizens, all sectors, is to get away as much as possible or stay away from the uh, more severe scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. And if possible, get even uh, at a better place than scenario two, flu plus scenario, um, and this is a scenario which is uh, also uh, labeled now by our Ministry of Health, the common cold scenario, uh, where you might uh, not even have a flu plus, but um, a better situation of mild complaints, no great pressure on, on care um, in a quite manageable situation. Um, I just mentioned it because this came out uh, from policy documents of our government, but the whole range, of course, has to be included in our preparedness. Next slide, please. And uh, of course, there are specific uh, recommendations uh, and measures in relation to specific scenarios, but as we don't know how the developments will be in advance with enough certainty, uh, we should be very broadly prepared. And that's why we gave some general recommendations, uh, which are not only important for the COVID perspective, but in fact also relate to preparedness for uh, other future crises or other crises that uh, may be parallel uh, already there. Anticipate the variant scenarios, uh, including global vaccination, 
the prevention of risk factors, as we know very much about these risk factors now, um, and good public communication as to what might happen and what the uncertainties are and what we cannot exclude. Um, second, um, focus on broad societal resilience uh, and shock resistance, not only in public health and care, but also socially and economically, uh, as we have seen uh, quite some measures already in the past years. Um, we have to uh, connect um, the recovery task of the COVID pandemic with long-term issues such as social inequality, sustainability, uh, also related to food and climate. Uh, this is especially important because um, uh, social inequality may be a factor in um, the risk of um, a, um, a higher incidence, but also a risk for higher impact of COVID in certain groups. Uh, and um, food and climate um, um, uh, challenges are, of course, related to the risk of future pandemics, for example. Um, it's important to protect the values of the democratic uh, rule of law. It has been under pressure uh, and it's very important um, also in future crises to keep the democratic role in place even uh, in uh, situations of crisis and invest in knowledge development, scientific collaboration, combating disinformation. We have all seen how important that is. Uh, next slide, please. And um, also in relation to um, the um, topic of this evening, uh, a basic question is, are we going to be a learning society in relation to what we have seen to be very important in the past years? For example, attention to hygiene more than in the past. Uh, as I said, shock resistant resilience. Um, public infrastructure in the various fields, um, the importance of social cohesion, as we have seen, are we um, in the situation that we can keep these gains with us, especially also in the position of the medically and social vulnerable people uh, and reducing inequities is then very important. Sustainability, I already, already mentioned this, uh, but also international dependencies and cooperation we have seen as being a very important factor. Can we better deal with that? Sharing knowledge, scientific collaboration, but also uh, keep in place what we have learned on processes of assessment of evidence on interventions to be faster in uh, uh, preparing ourselves for taking the right steps to combat uh, the pandemics. Um, finally, next slide, last slide. I would like to mention the scenario study of the International Science Council uh, just uh, published a few weeks ago. Um, and this has many similarities with our study. Um, what they did was uh, based on a broad expert judgments from various fields. Uh, considering the various factors of uncertainty, and they came to three global um, COVID-19 futures uh, for the past five years to be uh, developed. First is the continuity scenario, where COVID-19 becomes an endemic disease across the world with seasonal surges considered by this team uh, as being the most likely one. Uh, this is very much like our flu plus scenario. Uh, second, the missing recovery scenario, where scenario 19 remains largely a control. It's a fear re recurrences in parts of the world. This is um, a bit similar to our um, three to five scenarios as I present them. Uh, and then a very positive scenario, collaboration, collaboration plus scenario, where COVID-19's importance is substantially reduced um, because of strong international collaboration, an issue that they 
the thing that is probably the most important um, strengths we could have worldwide. Uh, with lessons learned, uh, with strengthened disaster preparedness, and better science for advisory mechanisms very broadly uh, constructed um, and uh, with enhanced resilience uh, against future crises. Uh, and also the recommendations they made are very much similar to our recommendations. Um, and um, if it would be possible, of course, to get to the, to get to the collaboration plus scenarios, that would be a very fortunate development, but we should still now prepare for the other ones. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this very nice introduction uh, to this evening, uh, André, and a very uh, important and careful uh, document, I, I would say, with a very broad spectrum of scenarios available indeed to, uh, to be prepared for the best and the worst. Uh, related to that, we have a question from the audience from uh, Adrian Malcolm, if I pronounce it well, and this is really about the fact that we're now starting to see or think that we are moving towards scenarios two and three and that maybe even our government thinks that it's even milder than a flu plus and a scenario two. Uh, what would the consequence then be for uh, our normal life, such as uh, education? Uh, does that mean that, that we should now all go back and teach in person, accepting the risk that the virus circulates among students, even in times when we're also going to travel to family get-togethers? And I would like to add to this question from the audience that how do we know when it's good to do this? Right? So the scenarios are, are clear, but there is a point where we have to decide where we are and how confident we will be about those scenarios. So, so how, do we, how do we go about that? Yes, well, let's say that our general recommendations are irrespective of the scenarios. These are um, recommendations for broad um, societal and, and health and healthcare preparedness. Um, um, these are not new recommendations. They have been made partly also, for example, 15 years ago by the Health Council of the Netherlands, but also international agencies. Um, so there will not be a sort of a point of decision on those uh, other than that it's good to be prepared. But of course, if you see specific scenarios to be developed, uh, like in new waves, it, it will be important to uh, and that's, these are very important questions to decide where is the point that you should upscale uh, measures of behavior or um, intensified vaccination programs or um, societal uh, measures. Um, and I don't have an easy answer to that, but I think that it will be important um, that um, in addition to the virologic, we have the outbreak management team, of course, that considers these issues already, um, but also to have the societal, uh, social science advisors that we uh, will have more in place uh, in, in from now. We have a, in the Netherlands um, uh, advisory team, especially from those fields, the social and economic fields, to also give input on that. Uh, and I think it will not be just, uh, let's say, ep epidemiolo uh, epidemiological numbers uh, on a numer numerical scale, but it will be a broad assessment um, uh, of developments uh, in society. Um, but it's not an easy task, uh, and uh, especially as these advice probably have to be prepared quite fastly. Um, in situations of increase. Um, so I would expect now uh, that uh, we do not wait uh, until autumn as we see increasing figures, but uh, have to get together with our outbreak management team and the societal impact team very quickly to think about this question. This is a very essential issue. There's uh, other questions coming in, and just for the audience, you can type your questions in the Q&A, and I, 
I, we may answer them by typing in answers or we will respond uh, here uh, in, the, uh, in the Zoom session itself. I have a question from Shia Knefis, which I will postpone to the final discussion because I think we're going to need some input from virologists on this question as well. And uh, not that I don't uh, consider your uh, virology knowledge sufficient, uh, André, but I think it's more fun to also get yes. the Florian's and Marion's right. perspective. But there's another question, uh, and that is, if we look at the different scenarios, and let's temporarily forget about the extreme ones, so don't, don't forget about zero and five, but if you look at two, three, and four, how, how different might the uh, possible government actions be in those scenarios? Very difficult question. Well, if we are clearly, if we, it would be clear that we go uh, maybe uh, within one or two years to flu plus, uh, it will be very much similar to be prepared for the influenza season. Um, and we know these measures and this will be controllable. Uh, but if we uh, see this continuous struggle between cat and mouse uh, for, let's say, the next four or five years, um, we will have to invest uh, very much more uh, in science to adapt, for example, the vaccines specifically to new mutations, because that would then be one of the core issues to solve um, with public-private collaboration to settle that. And also, uh, from the uh, social scientific point of view uh, and the social policy point of view, um, the um, societal divides uh, and, and long-standing discussions, uh, as we see them now, um, uh, related to, um, let's say, the relationship between the society and, and the government, um, will be a very important thing, social cohesion, a social divide uh, and combating disinformation. Uh, so these are some examples uh, that might uh, make a difference between those scenarios. All right, thank you very much, André. I think uh, we will continue to answer questions on this topic uh, in the final session. Uh, but now we will move on uh, to the second speaker of the evening. Thank you very much for your uh, excellent lecture. The next speaker will be uh, Professor Marion Koopmans. Um, she's a professor of virology, specifically public health virology at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. And Marion really don't need any introduction anymore. She's clearly one of the, the experts uh, in the Netherlands and well beyond on COVID. Uh, Marion will be speaking about a forward look from the virological perspective. The floor is all yours, Marion. Yes, thank you, Ron. Um, another challenging task here, um, because where are we? Uh, I think where we are is really in a transition phase uh, from the full-blown pandemic as we have experienced it the past uh, two uh, and a half years, and one or more of the scenarios that were sketched by the previous presenter. Um, because, and, and why is it so difficult to know at this phase where we will go? Uh, that is because um, we have a range of factors that determine the transmission of this virus. They are virus variants, they are possible seasonal effects and whatever we all do um, in terms of control measures. There's other factors that determine the impact, like vaccination rate, infection history, and underlying health. Um, but, and the current situation is that the level of control has really been scaled down, the level of testing has been scaled down, and we have seen a shift in policy with more emphasis on the role and responsibility of societal partners. So that means that currently we are in a transition phase a little bit uh, walking uh, blindly. Uh, forecasting has become extremely difficult because the models that were used were based on routine testing. Uh, uh, that, that was a core uh, underlying factor. And the road to action 
the questions that were just asked is really under development. So given the situation now, who acts when and where? So this is an interesting phase to be discussing this. But let's let, first have a look uh, where we are. So this is a global picture put together on the dashboard that WHO has where, and that's just uh, looking at the number of confirmed cases uh, over half a billion. These numbers of course do not mean that much because they very much depend on whether there is testing capacity, whether there is access to care and they are uh, for sure an underrepresentation but we have been uh, looking at them, monitoring them over time. And what do, does stand out is the massive, huge global synchronous peak that we've seen through the wave of Omicron, the surprise around uh, Christmas or early this year. Now, these are uh, trend data that look at mortality statistic deaths, deaths reported. Uh, a little over 6 million. We also know from studies that that is uh, uh, by at least a factor of three underestimated. Um, but of course, by the nature of the statistic, this is a more reliable uh, piece of information. And you do see the, the trends uh, here, the, diff the, the uh, peaking pattern, and you also see the decline globally in the numbers of reported deaths uh, following the, the massive Omicron wave, but also in part related to that, because fortunately uh, that uh, highly infectious virus, highly transmissible virus uh, had a lower uh, clinical severity because of uh, its changed properties. Um, because that is the, the factor that also comes in, in this uh, pattern of uh, waves and that those are the variants. Um, here we start with the virus as it popped up in uh, Wuhan. Um, and then already when the pandemic started to evolve in, uh, for instance, Europe, we had uh, unknowingly then a first transition and a first replacement with a more transmissible virus, uh, recognized now by this abbreviation. Um, and then throughout the year, later in the year, the first uh, real-time recognized variant displacement with the alpha virus variant. This also turned the tide in terms of our expectations for um, uh, the, our ability to really dampen down on the pandemic because until then, uh, right before then, we had seen quite promising uh, statistics or data on the impact of vaccination on uh, transmission, but with the subsequent wave of variants, that uh, effect of uh, vaccination really has been reduced because these viruses have managed to escape from uh, some of the vaccine-induced immunity, and the effect is particularly on transmission. Important in this uh, image is also that uh, we have these different uh, variants popping up, but there are regional differences. So in the period that Europe and the US were dealing with alpha, there, were, uh, uh, there was a massive circulation of other variants in the Americas and in African region. Uh, and that means that the backgrounds uh, of exposures may differ depending on where you live in the world. And that's of course relevant when we start to try and uh, estimate impact of, for instance, new vaccines on different uh, populations. Now with the evolving uh, pandemic, uh, these variants are sort of a consequence of what happens if you have a fast spreading pathogen here uh, depicted in different stages of disease emergence, uh, where uh, because of developing population immunity, uh, you will get uh, selective pressure on um, the virus uh, uh, variation that, that is generated through replication. Um, and those pressures may favor certain variants over others. And that's really that interplay between the virus and the host immune uh, system is really uh, at play here and is a not so easy to predictable uh, factor. The, the consequence of that interplay is what we have seen, um, and that is over time, 
the evolution of uh, one variant uh, uh, after the next that had a fitness advantage. Uh, and that fitness advantage is what we saw because those viruses then um, uh, displace the previous uh, variants and the fitness advantage here is expressed as the R value that we have all come to uh, recognize and come to work with. Uh, and the higher the R value is, the more work you have to do to reduce circulation. And it's clear that with the current variants really dampening down circulation. So let's say scenario one elimination is absolutely no longer re realistic if it has ever been, uh, that is. Now, uh, this part of the uncertainty looking forward is where exactly these variants evolve, where did they come from? Um, and this is best illustrated with uh, the example of uh, Omicron. Um, what you're looking at here is a uh, timeline uh, and in the y-axis uh, accumulating rate of mutations that we have seen fixated in the viruses as they circulate over the world, um, uh, but with uh, occasional popping up of these uh, surprises. And here, this is the Omicron variant, as you can see, very different from what was circulating before that, and um, so not, not evolved from the then circulating viruses, but branched off somewhere earlier in time where exactly is, uh, is really unclear. And the question is, where does this happen? Um, um, because uh, this uncertainty means are other variants uh, cooking somewhere? Are these undersampled regions? Is it animal passage or is it evolution within an immunocompromised host? And those are different hypotheses. I think they all still um, could, could be at play. So the first one is that maybe um, this is just what happens uh, because we are not, we don't have the full uh, overview of the global diversity of this virus. We've seen a massive global seeding event and then local continued circulation and evolution of viruses. So if you have regions in the world like here in gray or orange, where there's very little uh, surveillance, who knows what is circulating there. Um, and we may also only see those viruses once they um, uh, come into global circulation. And that can really uh, uh, take a while before um, uh, this is uh, possible because you can still have closed off communities. So this is a scenario that is still possible in my view. Second example is what may be happening in uh, animals. There was already a question about that. And that is a uh, certainly a, a, a possibility. We have seen um, examples here in the Netherlands of um, multiple introduction of the virus into uh, mink farms uh, uh, on several occasions and then continued circulation with human to animal to human to animal to human uh, uh, jumps, um, also associated with clear uh, selection of viruses with mutations in important places like the receptor binding domain, which is where the virus binds to host cells. That's not something you want to see as a virologist. <laughs> um, uh, and it, this happened and in our country, it was controlled because all the uh, mink farming was stopped. The same happened in Denmark, but that has not been uh, the situation in other parts of the world. And for instance, we know of uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, there's quite substantial mink farming where the decision has been to just uh, let the viruses burn through. And, and uh, I'm not sure what exactly is going on there. Other example is what is happening in uh, white-tailed uh, deer, specific type of deer. And it looks like uh, surveys in other parts of the world have not found deer populations positive, but for uh, some reason, uh, these deer in North America and in, uh, in Canada <clears throat> Um, have been seeded with SARS-CoV-2 again on multiple occasions. Uh, one study in Iowa found at least uh, six, I think, separate introductions. And here is an example from a study in uh, Canada where 
a highly divergent uh, variant was found in the deer and linked in a human case. So clearly a potential uh, variant scenario. This has not transmitted further, but it shows the potential. And then the third uh, example is that of, uh, and, and it's a hypothesis that variants um, evolve within people with immunocompromised states. Um, um, in which we do see chronic infections. So they will get, they can get infected and then not clear the virus. And by now there's quite a few examples where we see uh, accumulation of mutations. And this is a, a specific set of mutations that now has been found in several independent studies uh, in immunocompromised patients um, that may uh, also be relevant when we think about um, variant emergence. So what is done to really keep track of this? And this is the, the work that is organized at the WHO level through what, it, what they call a technical advisory group. Uh, there's a whole range of tags as they are abbreviated. And this is the one on virus uh, evolution. So that gets uh, together every week um, or other week, depending on the situation, uh, and it gets signals. So signals from the global uh, sequencing efforts that are ongoing from unusual outbreaks, reports, uh, and so on. So those are looked at um, off and discussed, and often that leads to further questions, and then there will be uh, reaching out of WHO to uh, a reporting country saying, okay, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Can you present what exactly you're seeing? Um, and combined, also combined with uh, data from laboratory studies, including, for instance, the network that uh, Florian uh, and Ron are involved in, uh, in across the U.S., um, there is a discussion if there is a level of concern and based on that, variants may become get, get a label as a variant of interest, meaning it really needs to be looked at more closely and uh, as a priority, or a variant of concern, which really means essentially uh, we expect this to become the next dominant variant, at least in parts of the world. <clears throat> um, and this is part of the information that uh, we all look at and then everyone uh, in the world now can look at. This is uh, how it's collected uh, through uh, GIS-8 and, and visualized. Um, and this is just the information from the last few months where uh, you see in the different colors, different virus lineages uh, tumbling over each other, where now we see in yellow here BA4 and 5, and all of these are derived from Omicron. So Omicron really has had a synchronous global wave and from there has been evolving uh, into uh, an increasing number of lineages with the most recent ones, four and five now uh, rapidly becoming uh, dominant. Now, what does that do? This is the image, picture that uh, uh, was shown also by the previous uh, uh, speaker. Uh, this is an image from our national surveillance uh, sewage trends, but now looking at the, the complete uh, uh, period since that surveillance was in place, so second half of uh, 2020. Uh, and you can see that we do have quite steep increase in the circulation of this virus very recently, um, and a very limited so far increase in hospitalizations, but with a big, big question marks is how uh, what this will translate to. Um, key question there, of course, is what is going to be the effect of the uh, uh, immunity that now is, of course, a very big difference from the situation that we had in 2020 and um, less so, but still in, in 2021. Um, and it, it's, it's really clear that um, uh, from many different studies now that repeated exposure to uh, the virus um, from vaccination and infections really has um, uh, enhanced the, the magnitude and the breadth of the antibody response. And that's illustrated in, in this study, for example. 
uh, it's a busy uh, picture, but, but I will talk you through this. So what we're looking at here is levels of antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, so functional, functionally important antibodies to an older virus, A, and a, an Omicron virus here. And these are uh, serum samples from people that had um, been vaccinated and had a breakthrough infection. And as you can see, they develop high levels of antibodies that also are uh, capable of neutralizing Omicron, although that, that, uh, the levels there are lower, but still well, um, well quite, quite nice uh, titers. Here's this situation reversed. So now you have uh, someone um, uh, first infected, then vaccinated. Again, high titers and uh, same uh, similar uh, high titers to um, uh, Omicron. These are serum samples from people that had the primary vaccination series, which is uh, one or two doses, depending on the type of vaccine. Uh, and there we see uh, low levels of uh, cross neutralizing antibodies to Omicron. Uh, and here you see the compensatory effect of that through the booster uh, vaccination campaigns, which we've, we in the Netherlands have had um, uh, over, well, by the end of the year and early this year. Um, and that booster has really restored some of those antibody levels and also has broadened them, uh, including um, neutralization of uh, Omicron. Um, and by now from uh, many studies uh, like this, studies in, in uh, animals using uh, animal sera, um, the picture is emerging that the viruses that we had before Omicron uh, somewhat group together antigenically and that the viruses, uh, Omicron and the derived viruses uh, are quite apart there. And uh, the discussion now is to start thinking about them as, as different antigenic entities, uh, maybe serotypes, that's uh, not, not settled yet. Now important of course is to realize that, so this is the picture that we see in vaccinated populations. But we also have seen that access to vaccines is very different in different parts of the world. Um, and there are still populations where very little vaccination has been done. So then you have to look at uh, what Omicron infection does, uh, that big wave of infections. Um, and you see again, uh, high levels of antibodies, but really not that much uh, cross reactivity with the previous, so other uh, uh, variants. Uh, which is relevant if you think in, in terms of that we really do not know what the next variant will to be derived from. So you would expect that people that have uh, had as their single exposure uh, the Omicron wave, which is quite a, a big uh, uh, group, they would have very limited uh, protection from infection with um, possible future, future variants derived from any of these viruses. And that, again, is not the case if uh, that same infection is done in a vaccinated individual. So, and that's, at the global level, very important uh, factor to consider. Now, those were uh, studies that looked at um, the Omicron uh, uh, BA1 and BA2, so the first viruses that we saw around, uh, uh, well, the, the early this year. Um, uh, and, of course, um, that's already outdated by the time these studies go online because of the speed of uh, variant uh, replacement. Uh, so there's now bridging studies also looking uh, how do titles compare between the older Omicrons and the ones that are now taking over here, BA4 and BA5. And you see that there's still yet another small reduction in, uh, in titers. Um, which is not happening in uh, people with a vaccination uh, uh, back, background. So now the question is what will happen? And th this is really a big, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's hocus pocus as far as I'm concerned. So what we're doing now globally is really look at each other and look at which countries have which waves, what are their backgrounds, and can we maybe from that 
uh, understand what is in store for us. So what you're looking at here is hospitalizations per million for different countries. I just took a selection here, France, and, and this is for the whole pandemic. So France, South Africa, the Netherlands, Portugal, Israel, UK. Um, and the arrows here are for uh, South Africa, which just had a BA5 wave, which was um, quite modest with very limited uh, access uh, hospitalization and they are over it already. Uh, but as I uh, explained, the South African community has quite a different background in exposures. Um, more close to home is uh, what's happening in Portugal, which also has had um, replacement, displacement uh, with uh, BA4 and 5, has had uh, more circulation, a considerable wave, um, increased uh, hospitalization, but not nearly, of course, uh, uh, like the historic levels, and is already over the tip, it seems. So looking at this, our current expectation is that we will see continuing rise in hospitalizations, but most likely this will be uh, modest. Now, of course, the question is also what does all this uh, evolving uh, uh, virus work do uh, and how does is the decision made, made about vaccine updates? And that's another tag, uh, WHO Technical Advisory Group, but now focusing on the vaccinations. So they take the information from the Virus Evolution Group uh, to ask the question, is there uh, reasons, are these viruses so divergent that um, they should be considered as new uh, vaccine uh, candidates. And if the answer is yes, there's a separate group that then looks at whatever data gets generated, including data from vaccine man manufacturers about pilot data with maybe vaccines with a new component in them. Uh, and this is currently ongoing for vaccines that uh, have uh, Omicron as a, as a component. And just uh, last week, uh, th this group came up with a, a statement given the current situation um, that, uh, that um, although there is increasing mismatch between the circulating viruses and the vaccine, the vaccines, uh, the, uh, the all currently licensed vaccines still confer high levels of protection against severe disease which is uh, one of the primary goal or is the primary goal of the vaccination program, uh, but that, that we do need to start thinking about ways to broadening the uh, responses because this, um, this virus evolutionary pattern will continue. Um, and uh, that means that we need to start thinking about maybe different vaccination uh, schemes, schedules, different vaccines, and that's what's going to be presented by the next, uh, in the next uh, talk. Um, they also said that it should, it, it is important to start thinking about uh, adding in Omicron, uh, but not as a replacement for the current vaccines, but as a bivalent vaccine. And those studies are now ongoing. So um, what does that mean? Well, uh, expect the summer wave, this is already outdated. We are <laughs> in, in a summer wave. Um, and we will see increased sick leave uh, and increased hospitalizations, but with considerable protection from uh, the vaccination if it is complete. And that's important um, because uh, the vaccination take up has been quite high, but the boost of vaccination take up has been considerable lower. And that's a factor that really can make a difference here. There is continued potential for a fall winter wave because right now we are almost on a three month uh, uh, wave um, uh, frequency uh, and it's not clear that that will not continue. And we also look at less predictability of uh, the known diseases like influenza because the uh, uh, circulation of those viruses has also been uh, uh, impacted by the pandemic. But in all, what we expect is that the impact will primarily be in a low and incompletely vaccinated individuals and high risk group, groups uh, with some uncertainties there. 
Um, so this is my closing, and that's a statement by Ed Young, who's a journalist who's been uh, awarded because of his uh, COVID uh, coverage. Uh, we do all long to go back uh, to normal, but normal did lead to this, and I do think we have to uh, put our brains together moving forward on, on how to build in some of the knowledge that, that we have gained, the expertise that we have gained into how are we dealing with infectious diseases in our rapidly changing society. Thank you very much, uh, Marian, for this update. Great uh, to hear. Um, we have plenty of questions in the chat uh, window. I'm going to fire a few at you. And the first one uh, is still the one from Shaq Nafis, because he not only touched on the animal part, but also part of the question was, how likely would it be that this virus becomes enzootic in animals and that has seasonal patterns in animals and continues to play an epidemiological role forever from now on? Um, well, how likely is difficult, but I do think it's certainly possible. We do, uh, I, it does look like the virus now is enzootic in uh, white-tailed deer, which is a big population. Uh, so elimination from there seems quite unlikely, um, uh, unless you would think of a way uh, that, that there is some kind of sterilizing immunity developing, which I don't believe in those animals. There's other groups of animals. We've seen importation um, of viruses into Hong Kong through hamsters that were shipped, um, big international shipments, and there's a big un controlled breeding uh, system of all sorts of uh, rodents in, in th this is in parts of Europe. And we've seen different types of outbreaks coming from that could very well be circulating in those kinds of systems as well. So I do think it is a factor that, um, that, uh, is, um, that doesn't get enough attention. There's another question from uh, a person named Luke. Uh, so you showed the world map with a bunch of gray countries where there really is no surveillance, uh, including uh, Suriname, uh, which uh, shouldn't be too hard uh, for us uh, to work with. Um, but is there any uh, initiatives to, uh, to fill up the gray and turn them into colors? So there's an initiative by the, uh, the plan was G7, then G20, uh, but G20 is a little bit... Um, uh, busy with other things now, but there is a big uh, uh, plan for really strengthening surveillance, uh, almost like the SAPI plan has been for developing vaccines. So they are um, uh, pushing for testing and sequencing capacity everywhere um, with, a, with a big uh, monetary push behind it. And this is uh, going to be discussed at the G7 meeting. I don't know if it, it, it is either now or it's just been. Uh, so that's a plan that is in place. Of course, these things take time, uh, but there is now a commitment to do that, but and particularly also um, a multi-billion dollar financial uh, commitment to establish it. And then a final question for you. Uh, there's more in the chat and coming up for the final discussion, but uh, the question from Onis, um, what is a sufficient level of immunity? What should we measure uh, and how to interpret it? Is it the case that we are now simply going to monitor when we start to see vaccine breakthroughs and people ending up in hospital again? Or are we actually measuring something, something and what are we measuring? Yeah, I, so that's the, the, the million dollar question. What is a good correlate of protection? Um, I think the, the, there is a, a reasonably good understanding now of what levels of neutralizing antibodies have uh, functional uh, consequences. So that is a measure, uh, but that tells you about um, whether people get infected and uh, about the circulation of the virus, the measure that is, uh, I think, equally, if not more important, is the cellular uh, responses. Um, and I think the good news is that so far, 
um, despite these evolving viruses, we have not seen, I think we virtually have seen no uh, escape from cellular immunity. So I would say that is an important one to keep focusing on, but I'm sure Florian has uh, ideas about that. Well, thanks Marion for that bridge, because that will then bring me to uh, the introduction of the third and final speaker of today. Uh, which is uh, Florian Krammer. Florian is a professor of vaccinology at the Department of Microbiology at the ICANN School of Medicine, Mount Sinai in New York. Florian is one of the stars in flu and COVID vaccinology these days, world famous. He has only one downside, if you were wondering why we're all speaking English tonight, is because he still does not master the Dutch language, unfortunately. And so we have to do all of this in English. Uh, Florian is going to be speaking about the future of vaccines. And I am very much looking forward to that uh, talk. Florian, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for this very nice introduction, Juan. Um, okay, let me share my slides here. I, I hope you can all see them now in presentation mode. Um, so what I'll try to do is uh, I'll also go a little bit through what happened in the last two years with vaccines and then how I see uh, how we can move forward with, uh, with, with vaccines against COVID-19. Uh, before I start, just very briefly, my disclosures, uh, our lab is working on vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 and antibody tests, and our university has filed IP that names, names me on, uh, as inventor on this, but this is not going to be uh, part of, of this uh, presentation today. So as you all know, uh, globally, we have a large number of uh, COVID-19 vaccines, right? So even in the, in the European Union, uh, there's five that have been approved. Uh, that includes two mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, two vectored vaccine, Ast vaccines, AstraZeneca and j, &J and then uh, recently the Novavax vaccine, which is a recombinant protein vaccine. And if you look globally, there's many more, including inactivated vaccines, uh, even vaccines like DNA vaccines or uh, uh, conjugate vaccines uh, like Sovereigna 2, which is used in Cuba. And uh, across the board, these vaccines have achieved relatively high efficacy against the original SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, of course, a lot of this changed now because of the variants, um, but uh, it seems that um, basically almost all vaccines that we develop uh, give us protection from uh, at least severe, inf uh, severe uh, disease with uh, COVID-19. And just to show you some data um, in terms of the mRNA vaccines, um, Marian already talked about three shots. Uh, I think a full immunization regimen is now three shots. Uh, and here's some data from a cohort study that we are running in New York, uh, where here on the y-axis, you see the antibody titer. Uh, on the x-axis, you have uh, basically days from vaccination. Here on the left side, the first two vaccination uh, uh, vaccine doses. Here on the right side, we're, we're looking at the booster doses. And then in orange, you have people who had an infection, then got vaccinated. In blue, you have people who were naive and then got vaccinated. And what you can see here in the beginning is if you get your first two shots, your antibody titers shoot up. Um, higher, of course, in people who already had been exposed, a little bit lower in people who were naive. Um, they shoot up to very high titers and then they wane over a few months, which is a normal um, process uh, at this point. Uh, and then you get stabilization. Um, and uh, initially, uh, this immu these immune responses protected us very well from SARS coronavirus 2. Um, even if you went out to uh, 200 days, there was still a good protection, which is this level down here. Um, and then if people receive the booster doses, uh, their antibody levels uh, shoot up again, approximately to the level that they had before, uh, after the first two shots. And then the waning is much slower. So uh, you basically have a much higher and much more stable antibody level. Now, the problem that we face here is that this is, these vaccines are based on the ancestral strain, on the original SARS-CoV-2, um, and that's not what's circulating anymore. And so your really high and nice antibody responses that you might have now after your third dose are not protecting you as well against the variants, unfortunately. And so uh, Marian already went through that. Um, initially, a lot of people were surprised by these variants, including myself, some other people were not surprised. 
Um, but relatively early in the pandemic in, in fall 2020, we started to see what we call variants of concern. So viruses that seem to be more infectious and that take over in the population. Um, the first three were the alpha variant, the beta variant, and the gamma variant. I think there's an argument ongoing if beta was first or alpha was first. But what they had in common was this mutation here in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. This is the a crystal structure of the spike here. And this here is our receptor is two. And so when you have this mutation in position five, 501, uh, the affinity of the spike to the receptor gets bigger, gets stronger, and that probably led to uh, this higher infectiousness of these variants. In addition to that, uh, the beta and the gamma variant already had uh, two additional mutations that allowed a partial escape from antibodies. Um, and then there were a number of variants of interest that didn't spread that far, um, that also had concerning mutations, but none of these variants uh, made too much trouble in terms of, uh, of vaccination. Uh, the, the, the alpha variant caused a lot of infections and a lot of deaths, but uh, the vaccines worked very well against it. Uh, the real trouble started with the Delta variant, and this was in spring of uh, 2021. I'm showing here on the left uh, Epidata from the US, but it's very similar in Europe. Um, you remember there was a strong uh, wave, winter wave in 2021. In the US, we had a small spring wave, and then the cases were declining. Um, and a lot of people thought, okay, now it's finally over. People are getting vaccinated more and more. Case numbers are declining. Uh, but then Delta went global from India and uh, basically started to dominate infections in the population. And in the US, this caused the summer wave. The problem was not so much that Delta is a strong escape variant, meaning it doesn't actually escape neutralizing antibodies that well, but it's highly infectious. And that even uh, that started to, uh, to cause uh, breakthrough infections. And then and I'm not going through all the, the details here. In November of uh, uh, 2021, Omicron started. Uh, Omicron was detected uh, first in a sequence from uh, Hong Kong a traveler who had uh, uh, had traveled uh, from South Africa. The uh, next day, uh, basically a lot of sequences from Botswana and South Africa were made available. Uh, and it turned out that an ongoing wave in South Africa was actually caused by this uh, new variant that was Omicron. Um, and the problem with this new variant uh, was that there were many, many mutations in the spike protein, uh, basically 15 mutations in the receptor binding domain. Uh, where most of the neutralizing antibodies bind and then several outside. And very quickly, as you all know, this uh, variant spread and uh, caused uh, large waves in uh, December and uh, January uh, of, of, uh, of this year. Um, when you look at the sequence of Omicron, um, of the Omicron spike and the mutations, uh, if you have an idea of where neutralizing antibodies bind to the spike protein, you realized right away that we have a problem. Um, and so uh, it was predicted just from looking at the sequence that this virus would escape uh, very, very uh, efficiently from our neutralizing antibody response. Um, and here on the right side, you just see some data, and Marion already showed some of that, um, how, how efficient that actually, uh, that actually is. Uh, here we have uh, different cohorts. Um, on the upper left, we have a convalescent cohort. So these were people infected with uh, the ancestral strain, and they have good neutralizing activity against uh, the wild type virus, as, as expected, uh, less against beta, which was the worst case scenario before Omicron. And then for Omicron, we see that most of them actually lose their neutralizing activity, at least at the detectable level. Here on the right side, uh, we have uh, the same data uh, but for people who got two shots of mRNA vaccine, and it's very similar. They have good neutralizing activity against wild type, but there's a very strong, uh, more than 20-fold drop there, uh, against Omicron. Um, if you look at people who got booster vaccinations or who have hybrid immunity, meaning they were infected and then vaccinated, it looks a little bit better just because their titers in general are higher, but their drop uh, against Omicron is, is almost as strong. There's just more residual neutralizing activity. Um, and as you all know, uh, first uh, this first wave of Omicron was, uh, was caused by BA1, but at the same time uh, as BA1 was detected, BA2, uh, another subvariant of Omicron, was already detected in South Africa, and that caused then another wave. 
Uh, BS3 was also detected, never took off. And now we have a further evolution of uh, BA2 uh, into uh, BA2.12.1, which is a problem in the US, and then also BA4 and BA5. What I also wanted to point out here in this phylogenetic tree is that Omicron is not a descendant of Delta. Omicron came from the center. It came really from wild type. And Delta did too. And the variants before that did too. And that's a very interesting evolutionary pattern. And we'll get back to that in a second. Um, and of course, now we have these, uh, these subvariants. Um, we're, we're facing BF4, BF5 waves. We just went through a BA2.12.1 wave here in New York. Um, BF4 and 5 didn't take off here. Uh, the numbers are actually declining. Um, but of course, the question is now, uh, how do we do our serum after vaccination neutralize uh, these subvariants? And this is shown here. This is from a paper from David Ho's lab. Uh, if you're boosted, uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, okay residual neutralizing activity against BA1, although much lower than what you have against wild type. Uh, BA2 is about the same. But then if you look at BA4, BA5, there's an additional drop, which suggests that you become uh, even more susceptible. Um, if you had uh, hybrid immunity, this is a little bit more steady. There's a little bit more, less of a drop. Um, but even if you then had breakthrough infections with BA1, there's still a drop against BA4, 5. Um, if you had a BA2 breakthrough infection, uh, this drop is not as drastic. But all of this data suggests that uh, a lot of people uh, can be reinfected by BA4 and BA5, which is, of course, problematic. Uh, nevertheless, we have to keep in mind that the vaccines still work. Um, what I'm showing you here is uh, data from New York State. Uh, there are other data sets out there. The, the New York State data is more on the optimistic side, but they do a very good job of measuring vaccine effectiveness across the population every week. And so what you can see here on the left side is uh, vaccine effectiveness in the population against symptomatic infection. And we start here out with about 90%, and then the Omicron era starts, and we're down to uh, approximately 70% here. Um, it's probably going to further drop, um, but uh, you see that there certainly is a huge impact by the variant. Um, the vaccine effectiveness against severe disease, in this case uh, hospitalization, um, is very high in the beginning against Valta virus, about 95%. Um, and that also dropped a little bit, but it only dropped down to approximately 90%. So I think this is an important take-home message that vaccination is still protecting us from, uh, from, these, uh, from these variants. And to just drive home that message, I wanted to show you data from uh, Hong Kong and New Zealand, which are two countries who did a really good job to keep virus out for a very long time. But then with Omicron, they couldn't do that anymore. And Omicron caused a pretty big wave in both Hong Kong and New Zealand. And this is shown here on the left side. This is already normalized uh, per million people. And you see this very steep wave in Hong Kong. And uh, at the same time, a less steep but more sustained wave of infections with Omicron in New Zealand in here in green. But then here on the red, right side, you see what happened in terms of deaths, right? And we have this huge peak of deaths in Hong Kong and then uh, a very low number of deaths in New Zealand. And the difference here was basically that in Hong Kong, only about 30% of the 80 plus population was vaccinated. Uh, while in New Zealand, it was more than 90%. And this was really this difference. And so this suggests that if you have baseline immunity from previous infections, from, uh, from vaccination, uh, or from, uh, from hybrid immunity, uh, you have a, uh, a, a, a relatively robust um, protection from severe infection. Not from infection, not from mild disease, but from severe infection. And I, I think... Uh, this is just my opinion here. I'm not a modeler and I don't uh, develop scenarios, but in my simple mind, I, I think with SARS-CoV-2, we are looking at, uh, at uh, uh, two different scenarios, probably something in between. Uh, we know that with human coronaviruses, we have seasonal circulation, uh, we have mild disease, and there's no vaccine because most people uh, are not, uh, not at risk of, uh, for severe disease with these viruses. On the other side, we have influenza, uh, where we also have seasonal circulation. We have a substantial uh, degree of severe disease. There, there can be a very severe influenza season, seasons, and we have annual vaccination. And 
in my very simple uh, model, um, SARS coronavirus 2 is probably going to fall somewhere in between here. Could be closer to uh, human coronaviruses or it could be closer to influenza. If it's closer to influenza, it's of course going to be a bigger problem. And I think this aligns well with some of the scenarios that uh, we have heard about in and Andre's talk. Um, but even if over time this becomes less of an issue in a way, um, still have to prepare for it, but uh, still, uh, I think the impact will be lower and lower. Uh, there are a lot of remaining issues. Um, the first question is how do we uh, efficiently prevent infection and mild disease? Uh, and this is important for a number of reasons. Uh, first, the current vaccines don't help with that. Um, there is a lot of breakthrough infections. There are a lot of breakthrough infections. Um, and then we see that uh, long COVID is prevalent in breakthrough cases, right? And long, long COVID can really be a big issue uh, and uh, can also have a, a big societal impact. And in addition to that, if a lot of virus is circulating, um, people who are not protected by vaccination, immunocompromised individuals, uh, have a higher risk to get in touch with the virus and have a higher risk to get in, infected. And this is really another uh, issue that is, is remaining. How do we protect individuals who cannot be protected by vaccination? And then, of course, it, the question, and, and Marian already alluded to that, is how do, how do we deal with emerging variants? And I'll walk through these, uh, these points from a vaccinology uh, perspective. The first question that we, we really need to ask ourselves is what level of protection do we want, right? Uh, one is protection from infection. We have a clear signal that neutralizing antibodies are uh, mediating this, and especially on mucosal surfaces, and we'll go into that. Uh, the next question is uh, protection from disease, and that depends a little bit on the incubation time of the virus, which has gotten shorter and shorter uh, with these variants. It's now down to about two to three days with Omicron. It was uh, longer before. Um, and so the shorter the incubation time, the more you rely here on neutralizing antibodies. Uh, the longer the incubation time, uh, the more of, an, uh, of a, a contribution of anamnestic B cell and D cell responses you have, uh, because these cells have more time to respond uh, before you actually get symptomatic. And then we have severe disease, and uh, you can get uh, protection from severe disease even if there is uh, no or low levels of neutralizing antibodies, uh, just by basically having a, a, an amnestic B cell response and a strong T cell response. Uh, maybe there's also contribution of non-neutralizing antibodies. And this is exactly what we see now with Omicron, where a lot of neutralizing activity is lost, uh, but there is a strong recall response of B-cells, and there is certainly still a D-cell response. Although there are now some hints of escape uh, from the D-cell response in single individuals as well. There's some data on that from Alex Seppes lab. Um, how can we now make uh, get better protection from infection? Um, so typically, when you get a respiratory infection, um, you get immune responses that are systemic, meaning high antibody levels in sera, uh, uh, circulating T cells. Uh, and those are really good at protecting the lung. Specifically, there's a lot of IgG that goes from serum into, into the lung, into the lower respiratory tract, and that can protect us from severe disease. But if you get a natural infection, you also make an uh, immune response in the upper respiratory tract that might consist of secretory IgA, for example, which is a special type of antibody that is uh, made by B cells that sit below the mucosal surfaces in the lamina propria. Uh, there could also be tissue resident uh, memory T cells here, for example. Now, if we get our COVID-19 shots, and they're all shots, they're all injected, uh, you get a lot of this systemic immunity. And in the beginning, a lot, uh, some of this IgG that you have in zero at high levels might also end up on the mucosal surfaces. But once your titers go down, uh, this disappears. And this, of course, protects us very well from severe disease, uh, but less well from infection. And one way to overcome this would be uh, to develop intranasal vaccines where you stimulate a good immune response in the upper respiratory tract. Uh, these vaccines are not available yet, um, and uh, they are in development, but they could help in uh, actually cut down on the number of infections and number of breakthrough infections. I put here together a list of, um, of uh, clinical trials with, uh, with, with uh, vaccines that might induce mucosal immunity that are given intranasally or orally or sublingually. 
Uh, you see there's a lot of them uh, in clinical development. Some of them are actually in late stage clinical development, including this phase three trial here with uh, the Codogenix vaccine, um, but also other vectors, uh, other systems like uh, an adenovirus vector that Bharat is uh, developing in India. So the question is really what will be the, will be the results from these, uh, from these trials? And specifically with vaccines that are uh, developed outside of Europe or outside um, of the United States, um, this might be complicated to actually get them licensed in Europe or the United States. Unfortunately, what we see, unfortunately for Europe, uh, we see now uh, that most of the late stage development here is taking place either in India or uh, in China. But this is something to watch, and I, I hope that uh, we will get these types of vaccines and that they might make an impact in the future. The other problem, uh, and again, we heard about this before, is we now have vaccines that are not matched to the circulating viruses anymore. And so we need variant specific vaccines uh, so that these antibody levels, uh, neutralizing antibody levels, get higher again, and we might get more protection uh, from infection and mild disease. Um, and both Moderna and Pfizer have, uh, are in the, in the development stage for, for these types of vaccines, either as bivalent vaccines or as uh, monovalent vaccines. Um, by, uh, Moderna has already released some data. Uh, Pfizer is expected to have data by summer, so hopefully soon. Uh, the problem that we have faced so far is that there was no, go no good licensure pathway for these, uh, for these vaccines, and I'll get more into that. Um, the Moderna data with their bivalent vaccine is actually public. Uh, I included the link below here. Um, and what I'm showing you here, and you can just focus on the on the left side here, uh, is the data that uh, they will base their, uh, their, their licensure application on. Uh, this is uh, neutralization data against Omicron. And what you can see here on the left side are individuals that um, uh, pre-vaccination, post-vaccination, uh, that got the regular vaccine, I believe, for fourth uh, time, and uh, this can, or third time, actually, I think, and this can boost their antibody titers, neutralizing antibody titers to Omicron, uh, but if uh, people with the same uh, immune history um, then get this bivalent vaccine, the Omicron titers are higher, in some cases uh, twice as high depending on the cohort. And this suggests that uh, bivalent vaccine in this case actually gives you better specific immunity to, uh, to Omicron. Unfortunately, this is BA1. Uh, this does not include yet uh, BA4 or BA5. And so this is the problem that I see here with vaccine updates. Um, this is a timeline of what happened with Omicron. Omicron was detected in November of 2021. Uh, in uh, December, January, we really had massive waves with BA1. Vaccine production started. Moderna jumped on this right away. Um, Pfizer followed. And uh, they started these clinical trials early in 2022. Uh, in the meantime, we had uh, BA2 waves globally. Uh, then these clinical trials had readouts uh, very recently, at least for Moderna. Um, and while the FDA will meet in the end of the month on the 28th to discuss the data from the clinical trials and um, make decisions of how to move forward with uh, specific vaccines, uh, we have another wave with BA4 and BA5 ramping up. And so uh, the vaccine realistically might be rolled out um, in September or maybe even later. Um, and this is, of course, problematic because the vaccine would have been needed here uh, to make a big impact. And so it took 11, or it will take 11 months or even more to get an outdated vaccine to the market. And the problem that we really have here is the clinical trials that need to be conducted um, in order to update the vaccines. Uh, so the question is, how can this process be made quicker? Uh, one. Uh, ways to uh, simply strain, uh, change the strains uh, without clinical trials. Uh, this would make vaccines likely available within uh, two to three months. And this is something we do for influenza every year. Uh, so the influenza vaccine strains are, are updated every year, and these updates do not require clinical trials. And this would be a model to move forward. Um, and this would allow them to uh, update vaccines quickly when a uh, concerning variant emerges. And the concerning variant might not be uh, really the difference between BA1 and BA4 or 5, 
but maybe a difference as we have seen it between Delta and, and Omicron. Um, and if you have these vaccines rapidly available, you would have a maximum impact on the number of infections. So the quicker you get it, the bigger of an impact the vaccine has. Um, and this brings us to another question, because uh, right now we don't know how this, this will, will play out, right? There's two models that we could have in the future for updated vaccines. One is uh, similar to influenza in terms of revaccination, where everybody gets a shot again every year in fall. Uh, that's one, uh, one possibility. And the other possibility is really a warning system where a new variant comes up. And only if a new variant comes up, a uh, variant-specific vaccine is used. And so we'll see how, how uh, regulatory agencies see that and uh, how, how this will be implemented. Um, there's, of course, other, um, uh, other approaches that people are taking now, too, uh, to get to what I call variant proof vaccines, so uh, vaccines that uh, wouldn't be impacted by a new variant uh, that uh, emerges. Uh, there are several approaches, including multivalent vaccines, not just bivalent, but uh, several different variants that might, might cover this whole space. Um, there are vaccines that focus on conserved regions of the spike or the RBD. This has been a little bit challenging because before Omicron, uh, conserved regions had been identified regions that were even conserved between uh, sars cov two and sars cov one but then Omicron changed these regions. And so we don't know exactly what can change and what cannot change at this moment in time. And then there's also the approach of consensus vaccine vaccines. Unfortunately, none of this is very far in clinical trials, and it's also unclear how these would get licensed. So this is another, uh, another puzzle piece. How do, we, how do we get this through, uh, through approval? And then, of course, uh, there's, there was for some time a lot of media attention about universal coronavirus vaccines, and I think that's a tall order, right? Um, you can separate those into barnes becco virus vaccines, which cover all Sapeco viruses, meaning uh, SARS coronavirus 2, SARS coronavirus 1, and related viruses. And this might be feasible, but it might take a long time. Um, people are also talking about beta, banned beta coronavirus vaccines covering basically all beta coronaviruses. Uh, this might be even more difficult and might even take more time. Uh, but would, of course, be good for pandemic preparedness. And then there is uh, the kind of a holy grail of a universal coronavirus vaccine that covers all coronaviruses. And there are two questions there. A, it's not clear if this is possible. And B, uh, it's also not clear if this is really necessary. Um, and so the last uh, two minutes I'll spend on, on the last uh, important issue that's still remaining, and that's protection of people who cannot be protected by vaccination because their, their immune system doesn't respond to vaccination. Um, and I got interested in that because we had a case here at Mount Sinai of somebody who had multiple myeloma, was treated with CAR T cells, um, then got vaccinated twice, um, and then unfortunately came down with symptomatic COVID, um, was admitted to the ICU and died. And retrospectively, we found out this person had zero antibody response and zero T cell response. And that triggered an investigation into a multiple myeloma cohort, where we then saw that about 15% of the people in that cohort did not respond to the vaccine. And uh, the ones that responded actually uh, usually had uh, waning immunity very, very quickly. Um, and so this is very important because the question is now, how do we protect these people? Uh, we, we looked into many different cohorts of immunocompromised individuals now, and we also started to study uh, the effects of booster doses. Um, we see that some of these people respond now to a uh, third dose, uh, and we had even cases where the third dose didn't uh, trigger a response, but the fourth dose now triggered the response. And so that's why I think that even if we don't have uh, updated vaccines yet, for elderly or immunocompromised individuals, a fourth dose with the original vaccine might be a good idea. And this is also something that was seen in a study in, uh, in Israel, uh, where protection from severe disease uh, was increased um, with the fourth dose in an elderly cohort, uh, while protection from infection uh, was uh, increased very, to a very low degree and uh, only transiently. Um, 
and so there are of course other options that we need to consider to to uh, protect these people I'll, i won't go through all of this but there are still monoclonal antibodies both prophylactically and therapeutically that can be used and we have now uh, at least two small small molecule uh, small molecule drugs that can also be used to protect these vulnerable populations. And this brings me back full circle. So why do we want to protect these people? It's A, because of course we want to protect them from, from disease, uh, but there's also uh, another uh, reason to, to really do that. And Marion already talked about uh, the, the scenarios where these, where these variants come from, right? Um, and of course, um, while it seems that coronaviruses are more stable because they have proofreading activity, uh, initially, uh, you could explain some of these variants because there was so much replication, there was a pandemic, so many people got infected, and the more the virus replicates, of course, the more chance for a mutation is there, right? But what people reported relatively quickly was that immunocompromised individuals to a certain degree can get uh, uh, persistently infected. And here's an example of somebody who was infected for 150 days. This is a, a New England Journal of Medicine paper from 2020. And uh, when you look at the evolution of the viruses in these people, because um, a lot of them have, have, uh, are not completely immunocompromised, their immune system puts some pressure on the virus, you see a lot of evolution and you can actually pick up some of the key mutations that we found in other variants. And so at least in my opinion, uh, this scenario of, of how variants are generated is the most likely that they actually come from immunocompromised individuals. And we need to find a way to treat these people and make sure that they either don't get infected or that we treat their infections so that this doesn't happen again. And um, the, the last point that I wanted to make here is that we, we just, uh, with colleagues here at Mount Sinai, saw this uh, with Omicron. Uh, we had a patient who was infected with BA1 uh, in December, and uh, the patient was infected until March, and uh, the virus acquired nine, uh, sorry, eight additional mutations in the spike protein um, in this patient. And the worst is that we started to see onward transmission in the hospital, but also in the community. And so this virus is probably now out there uh, in New York City and might become the next variant. And so uh, I think we really have to, to find a way to, to tackle that problem Otherwise, uh, these variants will, will keep surprising us. And with that, I'll summarize. Um, I think the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 remains unpredictable and the virus is here to stay. Um, we need updated vaccines, but we even more urgently need a process of how to do that quickly. Um, and we don't have that yet. We need improved vaccines that target uh, mucosal immunity, um, but also that give a broader uh, immunity. Uh, we can think about universal coronavirus vaccines, but I don't think that's an immediate uh, solution. And we have to think about uh, the consequences of infection uh, that still happens, right? Long COVID is real. We really don't understand it well. It's probably different mechanisms that cause different symptoms. And we need a vaccine that protects people from getting infected in order to protect them from long COVID. And then, of course, we need to find a way to, uh, to uh, protect our immune compromised individuals, uh, which remain at risk and would even remain at risk if the virus becomes a seasonal nuisance for the general population. And uh, I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Florian, for a very nice uh, lecture. Uh, let's do a few quick questions for you before we get into the general discussion. Uh, we have some uh, immunologists, vaccinologists firing questions at you. And one is uh, what is known so far about the durability of the antibody titles against the new variants like BA4, BA5. Is that similar or different from uh, other uh, Omicron variants after the fourth vaccination? Um, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the antibody titers that they're, they're actually different data sets. Uh, there are some data sets floating around that suggest that uh, the titers against uh, the new Omicron variants are actually more stable and there's less uh, waning. And then there's other reports that say that the waning is, uh, is very quick. It's actually quicker than uh, what you have against uh, in terms of boost against the ancestral strain, right? Um, but it's unlikely that the 
the fourth dose of the ancestral vaccine will uh, give you long lasting protection from infection or mild disease. I think that's already, that was already shown in that study in Israel. And another one is from uh, Rory de Vries, uh, who I'm sure you know. Um, so we're, we're all talking about the breadth of this immune response and the height of the immune response, the amount of antibodies now. Rory uh, puts the position forward that uh, he thinks it's mostly a numbers game. You need higher antibody titles, not necessarily broader. What do you think? Do you just need more or do you need a different type of quality of the antibody response? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think um, initially what we saw with people who had immunity from infection with, with uh, initial variants or ancestral strain or who got uh, vaccinated, right? Uh, there it's really just a numbers game, right? The higher you are, um, the more residual neutralizing activity you have against variants like uh, BA1 or BA2, right? Um, the drop is similar across the board. If you have low titers, you lose your antibodies. If you have high titers, it still goes down very rapidly, right? Um, for for uh, cross uh, for basically breakthrough infections with BA1 and BA2, I'm not so sure it's just a numbers game. I think there is some breath that you, you start to see there as well. Um, specifically with BA2, uh, you see more cross reactivity to BA4, BA5. Now, if that is... Uh, basically really cross neutralizing antibodies or if those are specific to BA2 and then it's a numbers game again that's a very different story and I think we need uh, really data on, on monoclonals uh, and b-cell populations to figure that out. One more for you but I'm going to ask the others to come back in the, in the camera already because this question could be bounced uh, to them as well and the question is really on on the regulatory authorities here uh, in the EU as well as in the US, is there already uh, some movement to be more flexible in vaccine updates uh, for COVID? I don't know. I, I can try to answer for the US. I think it will be a big discussion on the 28th, also not just about the data that, that has been presented now, but also about how to move forward, right? It's I think there's a lot of hesitance because it's a new platform. I mean, we're using flu vaccines for many, many years. Uh, and so we know what the problems are. Uh, but with the mRNA vaccines, uh, there could be unforeseen issues, right? And I think that's why they're hesitant. But I think this will be something that will be discussed in detail, how to get there. Um, so we'll see. Marion, you have anything to add for the EU maybe? No, well, what I know is that this discussion is ongoing, but indeed, what are then the, the it, it's a bit circular because you would want to know what are correlates, uh, are we sure about that, and how do you then bridge uh, from a limited uh, uh, immunization study like it's done for flu to, you know, what that means for, for the impact uh, globally. So I think it's really early. Too, maybe too early to do that, but it is a catch-22 uh, situation. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And maybe it's a little early. We, we all want to move to the flu-like system where you can just do this safely, but there's just not a lot of experience yet in, in the vaccines in the first place. And But then certainly the updating of the vaccines, we, we really don't have much... Uh, uh, much experience yet. And with flu, we really had decades of experience before it was uh, uh, made easier by the regulatory bodies. So. But we're also with flu now looking into how can you get the sort of the broader immunity. I mean, looking at Florian there because of, you know, so that you maybe can get away from that regular updating. And I think, I, I hope that that we will bring in that type of thinking into the coronavirus field as well. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not advocating of uh, having the same situation with uh, as with flu. I think the seasonal vaccines, uh, that's that's a it works in a way, but it's a terrible system, right? I just think that uh, having a strain change uh, without a clinical trial, as it is done with influenza, at least with the inactivated vaccines, would be an advantage in terms of speed and, and uh, an impact that the vaccine could make. But I think uh, I completely agree. We, we need a long-term solution for both for influenza and for SARS-CoV-2. 
I would right. only add that, that, of course, there has been a magnificent improvement in, let's say, the reduction of time needed for uh, assessment and, and re registration, uh, what we have already seen in the last two years. So that gives some hope that, given the need of being faster, uh, some creative uh, this might be found, although safety, of course, uh, should also be on the first place. So it's quite a challenge, uh, but there has been some achievements already. Andre, there's still a very interesting question for you in the uh, chat. And also I think the others may want to respond to that. So it seems that uh, uh, our current government is uh, is putting the responsibility for uh, much of the uh, future plans to take to the different sectors like the bars and restaurants or schools, healthcare systems, putting the re responsibility back with the people rather than uh, the government. What's your opinion on how to, uh, on, on, on to re responding to the different scenarios this way rather than a top-down approach? Well, I think uh, sector plans are very important because the expertise to find creative solutions in the balance between uh, what you would like to be uh, done uh, and let's say the trade-offs uh, to be made are in the sectors. Uh, but um, a few remarks, I think the sector plans uh, should be delivered a bit faster. There has been working already a number of months uh, and it shouldn't be uh, delivered um, um, when we are already in, in, in the mid of the next wave. But um, second, I think these plans should be reviewed, maybe also pretty fastly by uh, OMT related experts, but also uh, by the societal impact team uh, of which I said this should be already uh, very much working. Probably it is, uh, but we should see uh, their achievements in relation to this. Uh, but I think there's always a public responsibility. Um, and I think there our government has to show more in terms of uh, how to take this responsibility. Uh, for example, uh, Florian also mentioned this, the medically vulnerable people. Uh, there are various reasons uh, uh, to be vulnerable, but then you are, this can be um, the disorder, it can be not uh, being able to be vaccinated or whatever. Um, and then there is this public uh, responsibility to uh, take care that uh, this group is protected, but also has a reasonable level of, uh, let's say, liberty, societal liberty. Um, and um, for example, commun communication of um, uh, to increase awareness of this group, um, acceptance of that they may uh, have more often than others uh, mouth masks, um, maybe special arrangements in supermarkets or, or swimming uh, 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 pools uh, on special uh, hours, specific arrangements. Uh, maybe also for events um, that they should also be able to visit. Um, and uh, let's say understanding of um, that keeping distance, social distance for uh, this group. Uh, um, so, but I think what is very important in my last remark on this, consult uh, the patient organizations, include them in making the plans because they have the experience, they have ideas, I'm sure. And this should be made very much more visible in this sector approach. Do you have anything to add, Mario? I think this is part of our current paralysis. So uh, the, the idea is good because it is the step you need to take if you move towards uh, this is an ongoing problem. We will have to figure out how to deal with it and who can do what, but uh, what is unclear is who will pull the trigger, who will say, okay, and now step up your plans. Because of course, who wants to close down? Who wants to have less customers? That's counterintuitive. Um, so 
I think it's rather theoretical at the moment. <laughs> and we will have to see how that actually would work. Um, uh, and, and the second part is that I, 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 I agree with all the social science thing, but I also think social science uh, world has not really yet thought about uh, doing things with the speed that you need in, in terms of epidemic response. Um, and I hear a lot of uh, good recommendations also in discussing with people, but it takes a long time to get them done and that time is not there. So that speed and that sense of urgency, um, I think we don't we there's there's little ex, experience with that, and that is something that I think we need to figure out how that should be done. Um, another question from from myself, really. So Andre sketches this potential horror scenario where more dangerous viruses pop up from animal reservoirs or from immunocompromised hosts, maybe judging from your stories. And so far, we've been lucky that uh, after Alpha and D614G, it seems like the, 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 the severity of the disease has gone down. But now we're seeing infection of wild white-tailed deer and, and um, mink and other animals, maybe for the long term. We see infection of immunocompromised patients with a lot of mutations. What are the chances that we are going to see more severe variants next rather than the fortunate position of milder variants? Florian, Marion, Andre? I mean, I think Delta was already more severe than Alpha, right? Uh, with, with Omicron, we are back to where we were with Alpha approximately. I think there is a chance, absolutely. Uh, I don't think. Uh, there's a trajectory uh, necessarily. I think the only thing that really helps is that people have more and more baseline immunity and that will take away from severity. Even if a more severe variant comes around, it's not going to be similar to, to, to infections in, in naive individuals. But I think there is a chance that, that something comes that, that now is more pathogenic again. Yeah, I fully agree. If, there, if there's anything that has really surprised me with this virus is, um, of course, you, you see these uh, mutations, but all of a sudden we saw host range switches. So the viruses before alpha were not uh, infecting lab, uh, lab <laughs> mice. Alpha did. You know, I, I really was, I had not thought about that. Um, and the, uh, we've seen the difference between Omicron and Delta in lower uh, respiratory tropism. Um, we don't know what trait that is exactly, but um, I can easily see how that would be regained. Um, so I don't think we have any guarantees there. But, but indeed, the, the protection will come from the increasing level of, uh, of uh, immunity. And another question on the, a related topic that we see come back in the chat is, uh, is on long COVID. Um, so it doesn't seem that vaccination protects fully against long COVID. Um, is there any changes in the prevalence? Is there any relationship also to the immunity? Uh, what research is being done on long COVID? Because that is also, of course, one of the uglier scenarios in Andre's presentation where long everybody is going to mount up to having a long COVID at some point of time. Well, what I would like to hear from uh, the RRVM um, researchers, our uh, National Institute of uh, Public Health and the Environment, is more about the uh, nominators and denominators. What I understood is that uh, when you, you get, uh, when you are vaccinated and then get COVID, despite vaccination, then uh, being vaccinated is not very much effective in decreasing the impact for, for you uh, of the long COVID uh, trajectory. But uh, then it's very important to prevent that you get COVID. Uh, so I think that uh, vaccinated people, vaccinated people, uh, um, have 
giving uh, more uh, impact in decreasing the incidence uh, of getting COVID in that group will have less often in the end long COVID. Uh, so um, if you prevent it, if you're better in preventing it, um, then you will have it less often. Uh, but if you get it, it may be um, not less than non-vaccinated. So I would hear, like to hear more on, on those uh, numerators and denominators before saying too easily that vaccination doesn't make any difference. No, I and I don't think, think that's, 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 I don't think that's really the conclusion, no. but they did not see a difference in those self-reported mm -hmm. symptoms in the groups that were studied. Yeah. Um, because there is, um, I think pieces of information uh, that for instance, the, uh, frequency of long COVID is less after Omicron infection than other infections. The probability and the, the severity, um, there seems to be a relationship with the severity of initial infection. Um, and it is a multi-systemic, so COVID is a multi-systemic yeah. disease and the syndrome long COVID or post COVID is really poorly characterized at this yeah. moment. So particularly when you have symptom-based studies, I think it's very difficult yeah. to get really con conclusive information. I'm not saying that, that those symptoms are not real, but uh, they may be also be a very, very much a mixed bag of beans. So I think we really need uh, biomarkers that define what is long COVID. And there are some examples now, there are studies that find sort of uh, certain spots where there is, if you, if you really look very carefully, there is some level of persisting virus presence, olfactory bulb, uh, the gut has been uh, mentioned. I think we really need studies that combine these biological parameters before we can 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 say uh, uh, vaccination doesn't doesn't work because I don't think um, th that's what the evidence is at at uh, the moment. No, I think don't think it is. But the communication, the public communication now, uh, is a bit suggestive in that direction. And probably, yeah. if you take the good denominators. Uh, it might be even encourage vaccination also for the reason to prevent long COVID. I mean, I, I think we have to be in a way realistic. Uh, there is still a, an efficacy or effectiveness of the vaccines to prevent infection and exactly. that prevents long COVID. You do not get infected means you do not get long COVID. For the breakthroughs, there seems to be a reduction, but it's a modest reduction, right? Uh, but I completely agree with Marion. I think one of the issues is that we lumped everything together into long COVID, no matter if it's now a symptom that is uh, persisting for eight weeks or a symptom that is persisting for eight months, no matter if it's uh, fatigue or if it's loss of smell or if it's uh, really a loss of lung function, right? And those are very different things. They have very different mechanisms. And as long as we throw them together as long COVID as this like undefined mess, we're not going to find uh, a a way to to efficiently prevent it and b a way to efficiently treat it. I think we need mechanistic studies into what is triggering the different uh, symptoms. I agree. Yeah. I'm looking at the clock. We have one minute left. Is there any question that you would like to ask the other experts, just because you can? So, um, Florian, you're, you're not saying uh, pan-corona vaccines, but what about pan Um I think that's possible. I think it's much more real realistic than a pan-beta coronavirus vaccine, but I'm worried because not all subbico viruses are using ACE2, and I think ACE2 is in a way the common denominator. Um, so I think the cross between ACE2 and non-ACE2 binders is going to be difficult. 
And we also lack the tools for the non ACE2 binders to explore uh, immunity, right? Because it's just there's not a lot of research that has been done, and we don't know which cell lines to use for neutralization as is, is simple things, right? Uh, I think it's possible, but I don't think it's something that will be on the market next year, right? Yeah. All right. With that, uh, I think we should be closing the session. It's nine o'clock. Uh, we are past, We are through our time. I thank you very much for your excellent le lectures, uh, Andre, Marion, and Florian. Uh, we've already seen many compliments uh, to you in the chat, and I fully agree that uh, you were crystal clear, uh, very brief, and it was a pleasant discussion. I also like to thank the technical team for assisting us. And to our viewers, um, I would like to point out that this webinar, just like all the Kahnaway webinars, are available uh, from YouTube if you want to uh, uh, look at them again. And with that, I thank you for your attention and hope to see you again on the next Kahnaway webinar. Good evening. Thank you all. Bye.